Welcome. My name is Tristan Villamar, and I'm here with the Englishman. Today, we're starting our sixth episode of the podcast. This will be our final episode for this semester. However, we might come out with some more for next semester. Following me, we have Nicholas Biancolin. After him, we have Caleb De Silva. And following Caleb, David Armado. After David, Absalom De Vera. And closing it out, we have Ethan McMahon. Today, we're here to talk about, we have a few topics in mind. Uh, they all really stem from our English class discussions we've been having recently. Uh, I think we all came here because we would like to talk about them. Ethan, you said you had some points written down. Would you like to segue us into yeah. it? So today we're going to be talking about, um, I think, the attention economy, probably the social dilemma as well. Those two come hand in hand. And then we'll also be talking about whistleblowers. So like people who sort of step out against the big corporations and governments to sort of tell everyone like what they're doing and how horrible it is to try to help everybody that ultimately ends up in them being hunted down by that corporation government that they step out against so that's what we're going to talk about today uh first we're going to start with the attention economy so does anyone want to sum that up give their ideas on it i guess i'll go first whatever um so the attention economy is basically because in the past there's been like the service economy and then like the manufacturing economy where like the uh, the economy was driven by manufacturing. They made money through manufacturing goods and they made money by providing services. And in the 21st century, the new thing is the attention economy, which is basically corporations make money by grabbing our attention, by like taking our attention and basically like looking, making us like look at ads and look at like um, selling our data and stuff like that. And our attention is now the product. You know, it's, it's the... It's what they're trying to grab. It's what they're trying to produce. You know, that's how you get clickbait headlines. Is how you get stuff like that. And in my opinion, I don't think, like in like in its own way, the attention economy is any worse than the manufacturer or service economy. But I think it is. You have, there, it's much more easily able to become worse because it can often lead to you know where people aren't producing things just you know to actually have good things you're just producing it to get your attention just for a second just you know for clicks or you know it's not actually meaningful and sincere it's just kind of just trying to get your attention you know because that's what drives the econ like that's what drives the economy that's what drives their sales that's what drives all that kind of stuff I have to say, I have to, I disagree with you, David. I think that the attention economy is worse than the manufacturing economy. I think it's probably one of the worst economies. Now, saying that we all know social media is, you know, good. You can meet friends, you do posts, and you show people cool stuff. But the downside, what social media also does, how it exploits people, causes um, very bad things. For example, we all, like, January 6th, I think, 2021, you know, the American Republicans, all the Trump supporters attacked the Capitol, trying to bring down basically everything so that Trump would be president, right? And, you know, the cause of that is obviously a release, but they get fueled through it through social media. And that's when we get to the attention economy. You know, these apps and stuff, it makes it all worse because their goal isn't just to sort of give people posts and what they like. The algorithms and stuff just solely focus on giving you posts, no matter if they're good or bad or if they're wrong or correct, just to keep you attached. And that's, I think, why the attention economy is is the worst out of all of them because when you go through that mentality that you know we don't care about what we're going to show them we're just going to show them stuff to keep them hooked that's when you get the big divide in democracy between the democrats and republics which we're seeing in america right now throughout the past elections in the past like probably six years right and so i think that that's how the attention economy for me is like the worst and why it's why i think it's a problem Yeah, yeah, solid point. I definitely agree with you on the whole polarization thing. You know, I think it's definitely an important part. Does anyone else have anything to say on the attention economy? Only that I completely agree with everything Easton said. Yeah, yeah. You definitely. Yeah. I mean, Ethan, you made some solid points. Uh, I'll go with David's side for a little bit here. Um, then again, this is not a competition. I think it's it's fairly safe to say that both of these economies, not exactly the greatest things. I mean, you guys know my economic positions, right? You know. Tristan knows well better than anybody my uh, my positions on economics and you know my ideal economic system. So you know, knowing that, I tend to agree with David in that like there's no again there's no denying that this attention economy is terrible and it's rotting our minds. Like you look at people who swipe through TikTok for hours 
And like, it reduces your attention span to the 10 seconds you have on the one. And then when you're uninterested, you just go to the next one. So when you need to focus on something, you know, important, like a, an essay or a physics lab or whatever you might need to, right? It's, it can become much more difficult to focus. Then again, this materialistic economy that David brings up and this, because I know your theme for the issue is consumerism, right, David? I know you're not exactly, yeah, not exactly thrilled with consumerism, right? Yeah. You come, right? And I totally agree with you because one, it's wasteful, right? Like the amount of buy, buy, buy makes things a lot less to last and a lot more to sell quickly, which obviously creates much more waste, terrible for the environment. And then you look at things like, I know on your ISU, David, you talk about wealth distribution and how this capitalism is fueled by this materialistic economy because mm -hmm. everyone wants to buy, buy, buy. And then companies have a more capitalistic incentive because that's, yeah. that's the, way, the way things are working. Right? But then again, people are incentivized to buy, 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 get more stuff, spend more money, creating a further, I guess, wealth gap. Is that what you would call it, David? You're correct me if I'm wrong I mean, here, but... wealth inequality, yeah. That's wealth inequality, exactly yeah. a great thing. Mm -hmm. Ethan? Well, which economy makes more money? Ooh. Obviously, the attention economy. The, all the social media companies combined, you know, Google, Facebook, this and that, they make trillions. Trillions. That's like billions, probably trillions, more than what the manufacturing. So, you know, while this capitalist uh, thing can cause, bad, you know, bad stuff, like it's the attention economy that's a step further, both in money and in, I guess, destroying democracy. And that's why I think it's it's just a tad worse, you know, that it, it's just that extra flair it has, you know? Yeah, I definitely get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Anyone else? Or are we going to move on to, oh, does Tristan have something he wants to say? Come on, Tristan, talk to us. We love hearing from you. Uh, I, if there's any noise in the background, I apologize. Um, but let me just say, I think the attention economy, while it does have many, there are definitely negatives you can attribute to it. For example, the, lies, the rising case of falling attention spans throughout children nowadays, right? Uh, I remember when I was growing up, well, I sound so old, but when, when we were growing up, right, we, we didn't have phones until like maybe grade seven, grade eight, right? Like it was later on, right? We got those. And I know for my parents, my dad didn't get a phone till like grade 12 of high school, right? Like now my brother, when he was grade five, grade six, that's when he got his first phone, right? It gets younger and younger and they market younger and younger. I think that obviously isn't the most positive thing because they obviously kids are, are more of a side effect, right? Like they get trapped in the consumerism or trapped in the models made for adults or, or young adults, right? Um, but I think this attention economy does wonders for the economy itself, right? Like there's never been, in terms of the amount of wealth there is and the quality of living, it's this is the best time to live than in the past. Right. In terms of what a hundred dollars or the equivalent of a hundred dollars in the past would buy you, because obviously you have to account for inflation, you can get a lot more in regards to food, in regards to technology. And obviously there there are negatives that come with that, right? Um, but I think in terms of the impact it has had on the economy, we have seen lifespans generally go up throughout every country we can we consider. Um, I know places, even in Africa, are all because they, ru they run on, uh, I think it was Zimbabwe, where their country, their, comp their country completely collapsed, right? They had a complete economic collapse. They started printing money, it did not work. Um, so they all transferred to online tap pay because everyone had a phone, everyone had a chip, and they could track, they could basically track your bank account to that chip. So instead of having to pay millions of banknotes for bread that you couldn't get because they were everywhere, you could just do it online, put it in a bank, online withdraw. I think with technology, this attention economy, that wouldn't be possible at a previous date. And I think there are positives that we can take away, but yeah. But then it becomes a question of like whether the, the social impact and the ethics of it 
over like outweighs the money like the, is the money and the, the way the way it i guess improves life is that greater than i guess the ethics of it and what actually happens on in, in the economy and how they they make their money and how they do this and that because you know there are the benefits like yeah they improve the quality of life they connect people right there's lots of examples you can give about social improvement as well but then there's that one event or there's that just general change that happens within the thing that completely can destroy something you know or or ruin it or make it worse so like do you think that the the amount of money and the amount of quality of life that's made um outweighs the social consequences also before you answer just a little thing here yeah. i think i also have to stress that correlation does not equal causation i don't think the attention economy is what drove up standards of living i don't think the attention economy is what improved like social gains and everything I don't, I think like you, like sure that while the intention got has risen, like those have risen as well, but I don't think that's causing it just because they do it at the same time does not mean one is affecting the other. Um, the point, uh, the causation and correlation is first if the, okay, we'll just, we'll get so quick. Cause we got, we got plenty of other exciting topics. I know we all want to talk about, right. Um, to me, the attention economy is grabbing people's attention there and Obviously, now the, the best way to do that is through technology. So, in order to do that, you have to produce the best technology for the best price, right? If Instagram was paid or if Facebook was a paid service, they wouldn't be able to market you as an individual, right? They wouldn't be able to sell your information uh, to sell, or, or sell you out to advertising. But at the same time, the amount of users would obviously go down, right? I think having this ability to connect to other people for free yes it is can often be used it can be used negatively but there are also many times it's used for good there are so many times you'll see people do their best to share something to make a change right if you go back in time to it where because of attention economy the attention economy it is so much easier to spread information it's also easier to spread misinformation that has to be said right but at the same time in comparison to uh 50 years ago even the ability to spread information was very difficult. You've seen it. You've probably heard about a hundred times. People believe Nelson Mandela to be dead. In reality, he was just doing his own thing, right? He wasn't a big name person anymore. Obviously, for example, Martin Luther King had such a big impact because he was able to spread his message, right? That's something, spreading a message, yes, terrible messages can be spread, but it's attention economy has developed technology to the point where we can also spread positive messages. This also helped our economy in the sense where because there's this big influx of money going in, it equates to there being better development in terms of technology, in terms of stuff we would not be able to get. To market a better car or to market a new car, it has to be better than the previous one. It has to be better than, there has to be upgrades from the previous model if you want to keep people from buying it or buying from your competitor. So. Thus, the car becomes self-driving, becomes the, now we have all these electric cars coming out into production. I think with the attention economy, the ability to compete for others' attention, it also, it turns into a, uh, competing for products, competing for products that are better, cheaper, more affordable, or they appeal to the customer. That's why you can find plastic straws and paper straws. It's why you can find electric cars at a, at a premium. They're not a premium. Uh, being manufactured more often now than in the past. I think the attention economy does have some very terrible consequences that, as we can see, can go out of control, right? Um, but there are also some positives that come out of it. And I think in comparison to other economies, we can take those into account too and see that maybe, yes, there are some negatives, but we can also work on accelerating the positives and working to move away from these negatives it's kind of like uh what's it's kind, it's kind of like uh what's his name again um mcluhan's marshall mcluhan's uh touch hat thing so yeah. yeah but like that's not what the attention economy is okay, you the products me aren't the manufacturing economy that's being shown through the online platforms and stuff the product is us that's the attention economy they're not competing to show which product is better which car is better this and that but they're just competing to get as many people as they can on their platform 
that's what we're the product in this whole attention economy right and that's where i think so like you know yeah you could show good stuff in this and that but in the actual like platforms and stuff and this is what you saw in the social development through the data they provided us from the actual founders of these things they said that the actual fake news and the bad stuff spreads like six times faster than the actual good stuff right and so they're, what they're competing for is it's not like to show which car is better than this and that. They honestly don't really care about that, right? That's just how they make money. They're like, okay, we're going to show them all this stuff because we're the product. And then the advertising companies will just come and give us whatever the heck they have. That's how they make their money, right? So it's good that, you know, you can go online, you can go to Amazon, you can go to Walmart or whatever, and you can look at, ooh, this paper is good, this and that. But when you get down to the real attention economy, it's not selling products because that's just the manufacturing economy, right? They make their product and then they use these platforms to sell their product. That's that's that, right? The attention economy is like, okay, they're giving us their stuff, but we're just gonna put this here. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna design our thing so that we can use basically the data that we collect from everyone to sort of mold their own understanding. And that's kind of what you see in terms of like, like profiles and this and that is like if you were to go to like even just google right just google if you were to just type in something like climate change is all of us would have different results right and the goal there is not to sort of sell which product will make you more green which is the, the goal is just okay what can we show this person to keep them longer on our platform so that we make more money from the advertiser right so that's that's the that's the attention about it yeah, going back to wait, going back to one of the points you guys mentioned earlier about social development and the attention economy, or even just social media in general, being able to connect more people. I was I was thinking about it, and I, I would argue that it would hinder social development just because you're giving people, especially younger, like teenagers, another option to interact with others that's not in person. So you. A lot of times when people are interacting online, their camera's not on, they're not having like meaningful dialogue, like they're not, when, and I'm, what I mean by that is like, they're just talking about the game, like what, or whatever, if they're gaming, if they're talking about whatever, you're not having that like physical interaction with someone, which I think would really hinder, uh, especially a younger person's social development. That's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, and then on top of that, when, when they're also online, there's also the, the possibility of cyberbullying, right? Yeah. So once they do take away that, you know, sort of face-to-face -face interaction with other people, then because there's that, obviously, screen, which is what it is, that's holding these people apart, then you can say certain things in this and that, and, you know, you won't really be known, right? And, and certain things can go wrong, right? So not only does it create that hindrance of, like, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, social interaction, but it can also turn it upside down by even, by making it worse through cyberbullying and that. And that makes a big effect on obviously everyone. And the sad thing too nowadays is that it's like Tristan said, younger, like younger and younger people are getting phones in this and that, right? Like I'm sure, I remember when I was in grade nine, I went back to my, my elementary school and the grade fives and sixers, right? So who were like grade, or whatever when I left elementary school they all have phones right and they were talking like us high school kids right and I'm thinking like how 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 could you give these kids a phone like that just doesn't make sense right am I crazy or like are, are they too young like what do you guys think I agree I, I think I think grade fives and sixes and even just elementary students in general I think they would benefit a lot more of not having an electronic device or having limited screen time each day I think that, but that's also on the parents too, right? The parents need to be involved in that and need to know. So we, you got to educate the kids, but you got to also educate whoever's like in charge of them. Just so they, just to make sure they're on the right path. Yeah, I'm going to jump in. We have 10 minutes left in the Zoom, it says, but I'm going to jump in here real quick and then we can start a new one for the next one because this is a great discussion. But um, Caleb made a really great point. It's about education, right? So uh, I didn't get a phone until I was in grade eight. Right. And by then, like, even, even though like we're, we're past this generation, but even then, like, even in my class, I would say 90% of kids had a phone in grade six and me and a few others didn't and everyone else did. Right. So naturally I was out of the, we won a few things, but I think if I had a phone then, and if I had a phone then, and I knew what I know now, 
like what we talked through Freitas and things like this, understanding like regulation of screen time and doing other things, right? That's important. But the thing is, when these kids are given these phones, they're just given the phones and set and you know told pretty much you have free reign, do as you please, which is very, very dangerous because these tools are so powerful and so useful, right? The amount of things like my phone right here, it's you can't really see on the background, but it's awesome, right? I can I can communicate with friends, I can look at memes, I can play words with friends with Ethan, and not Caleb yet, but soon. You know, it's it's I'm a losing fantastic words with friends too. Oh hush, Tristan. You know, but it's things like it's so helpful because it just enables you to do so much more, the calculator and the camera and the communications device and the GPS and anything you can need it for. It's it's such a multi-purpose tool. But the problem is, like Christian said, it's very useful, but there's also a flip side of that coin where it can be very dangerous, right? Like cyberbullying was huge in my year in grade six because these kids don't know any better, right? You just gave them a phone and said, do whatever you want. Kids are psychos. They're going to do whatever they, they have no, they have no moral compass yet. They don't know what's right and wrong. They just, they're immediate. They're like little tiny narcissists. They're like me, 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 me. And that's it. That's it. Exactly. They do stuff. And if, if they don't know what they're doing is wrong and they don't, you know, they don't have any sort of sense of regulation, they're going to go way off the deep end. Right. Like, and that, like that ties in more to like, you know, teen, more teens having body dysmorphia and things like that from social media and cyberbullying as well. And just, lack of attention span is, I think education, Kayla put it really well, education is just important. If you educate these kids on proper usage of a phone, right, before you give it to them, they're going to be a lot better off with it. And if you just give it to them and say, do whatever you want. Nicholas. Go ahead, Tristan. No, Kayla, Kayla, go. Okay. So it also depends on like how you educate them, right? Because a lot of a lot of people, I don't know about you guys, but in my elementary school, we had a lot of presentations about social media and just online presence. And all they said, all that I got from that was don't do this. Don't call people names online. Don't do that. But they didn't explain it. They didn't explain why not to do it. And nine times out of 10, you tell a kid not to do something, they're going to do it. So like... They, like these, like these adults, they might be educated in terms of like how to act online, but they're not properly educating younger people. That's what I think. And if they're going to do presentations like that, they have to be, they have to like research topics. They got to explain stuff. Even if they think that most kids won't understand what they're explaining, I think it's worth trying then as opposed to just saying, don't do this. I'm going to add to both your points. On top of that, like, would you be better off with a phone in grade six when everyone else got their phones? Like, would it make any difference? Would it make your life better? No. Right? But you don't need a phone when you're grade six, obviously. Exactly. Like, you what are you going to use it for? Yeah. Right, just like a phone? Want to say something? Or yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just... <laughs> okay. Okay. So, but would you classify? Yeah, okay. Not would you classify Nicholas, Caleb, Absalom, Ethan, and David. Um, how do you feel about knives? You know, after all, they can be used to kill people. They can be used to hurt people, right? Obviously, but at the same time, you know, just yeah. you know, cut yeah, off your. Cross. I understand how I'm point, I'm no, 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 no. Okay, no, Ethan, no, you're no, the wrong way. The point is the point. The point to, dis to, to dismiss Tristan here is. Children don't have knives. They don't use well, knives. Like, but they have access. Is, they still have access to a knife in their house. The thing is, the thing is, the thing is are like, the cabinets locked twenty four seven? But like knives when have been was... around for like so long, right? So like, like obviously, like obviously, the parents are gonna teach them. Oh, um, knives are obviously dangerous, right? But like phones, right? They're they're relatively new, right? So if we talk back to the uh, Marshall McLuhan's tetrad, right? Like it's relatively new phones, right? Like and they're still developing and like innovating new ways to implement other things into it so like we don't really know yet we like we haven't discovered like the full dangers of it yet unlike a knife right like it's sharp oh it's okay easy. Exactly. Yeah, and also, because like absolutely yeah. said because we haven't discovered those full dangers that's why people are getting phones like all the time right it's not like yeah. you're you have your sixth grade six-year-old and they're like hey i'm gonna give you this beautiful knife that you yeah. can go <laughs> and do whatever you want with it like it's that's shiny, we all know bright. how a knife works and what it's capable of. Yeah. You know yeah, how there phone are still, works. There are not... still people 
who are, who are kids who do dangerous things with knives. We don't ban knives. But the knives. thing is, like, a phone a phone doesn't look dangerous from, like, if you look at it, it's not dangerous. Like, you don't see any harm in it unless you actually use it, well, right? But, like, as a knife, you could look from it from a distance and be like, oh, that's sharp. It, it could cause physical damage. But, like, a phone, that's mental. It could, it's, like, affects you mentally, which is totally different, so. Yeah, I would also argue that phones are more, potentially more dangerous than knives just because, they keep people interested. Like you can't stare at a knife all day. Like you're not going to be focused on it. You're not going to be focused on it for a, like, some people. for a significant amount of time, right? You're on the phone 24 seven, which like just opens up possibilities to, for harm and for like hindering d- development. Like we talked about and that stuff. But I know what Tristan's trying to say though. But the yes, point I'm I making think- is you guys, you're all coming in with this idea that a phone is dangerous. That a phone is this terrible device. Yeah, yeah. Right? When in reality, not terrible. Also, I just think it should be it should be used at a certain age. That's all. It's like it's like alcohol. Alcohol can be addictive. You know, you can get obviously right. And it's the same thing with the phone. And that's what it is, right? It's it's a piece of addiction. So like it should be like parent. And this is not something I think you should make a law. Like no one can use a phone at this age. It's just like the parents should just have a general idea. Okay, maybe. You know, I know what a phone does. I know what it's capable of. I know how it's changing everything. Maybe I should just give it at grade eight, like when we are, or even later if they want to, right? Yeah, I raise my hand because I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think the thing they're all missing here is that the difference between knives and phones is think about it. So let's go through, so let's assume you're talking about knives for eating and not knives like Swiss Army knives or whatever else you might need a knife for. I don't know what you're doing your free time, Tristan, but that's none of our business. You know, you keep your <laughs> knives locked away. I'm kidding. But... Cut some really good lemons, man. Make some nice lemonade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but let's talk about food, like our food journey. When we're born, we just have formula, right? And then you, from formula, you graduate to soft foods and then slowly graduate to hard foods. And then graduate to hard foods with, with minimal cutlery. You get a fork. And I know when I was, when it was my age, we got a fork and my food was cut up for me already, right? And then after or that, or your hands like abs. <laughs> right? And then from there, you get a fork and you get like a, a dull butter knife to understand how cutting works. So you don't hurt yourself, right? You get the motion. And then once you're comfortable with that knife, then you get the steak knife and you know, pointy, dangerous. This is how I use it. I don't throw it at somebody. I don't. That's no fun, Nick. <laughs> but, but see right here, right? You're introduced to it at a young age. Right, but if you're introduced to a knife randomly at eight, you're probably not gonna kill someone, you're right? You're not someone. gonna, you're not gonna. Well, I don't know about you actually. But <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> the point I'm making is that we focus, uh, we we always like to see the negatives, especially yeah. when it comes to technology, right? In reality, I first I didn't have a modern phone until like grade seven or grade eight. I had I had a very old, rundown model. That, they, that my parents got for cheap. Why? Because I went to a school in Adobico. It had a tracker in it. So and I could give the location to my mom and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to worry if I, on a night I had to take this, the transit home, right? Like that's just one example of something that maybe could not have happened. That's a 45, 50 minute bus ride that I'm usually taking if I'm, and normally there's people who go with me, but if I'm not and I have to go by myself, that's a long bus ride, especially for a kid in elementary school. Right. Uh, I like phones because the environment I was in was me and a bunch of other kids from all parts of a general area in the city went to this school and we had group assignments. We had to do media reports. We went to competitions where if you won and there were kids who won and they went far in it, you went to, I think somewhere in the States, I think it was Tennessee. It moved every year and compete internationally. Right. Like there was a lot of stuff, a lot of responsibilities and the environment we had basically, we used this. So we, as a kid, we didn't get lost in all of it, right? You could, this was simple. You access Google docs, you make maybe one group chat on Instagram. And that was it. You chat in Google docs. That's how we chatted back when you used to have that feature, right? We'd say everyone, if you can get trying it on at six, we'll try and work then. We'll, we'll do an nice little Shakespeare because we, we did Shakespeare play rewrites, right? 
so we did Hamlet, but modern. So we did, I remember I did movie star Hamlet, you know, like classic. He's an actor. I played, I played Claudius. I died. I mean, everyone died, but <laughs> we also had one trip to Stratford to watch a Shakespeare play. And I love Stratford. It's, it's, it's really nice. I rec- well, you know, we should all go one day. Mm-hmm. Actually, but, what do we have on this year? Let's see. But I still remember me and my friend, we got locked out of the theater. We left during intermission and we got lost trying to find the washroom. And we were buddy systemed up out there, right? And imagine that, like, this was, I think, grade six or seven. We're lost, right? We had our phones. We weren't too worried. So we kind of just sat around on one of the couches and we just watched the play up there. You know how they have like the outside area? Yeah. yeah so we were there. We kind of watched the play there. We walked around to the shop, but that was pretty much it. We couldn't go in, right? Because. We should see Hamlet. Yeah. Hamlet's, Hamlet's awesome. Their performance of it is amazing. Um, and that's why I think I've also seen a lot of people use social media to make a change, right? Or do get large in, uh, large surveys from people. For example, you see it now we have a lot of uh, student-run activities that basically see how we're doing during lockdown, right? That wouldn't be possible maybe 20, 30 years ago. I think, yes, there's some very terrible things that can occur from this, right? Mm-hmm. And there definitely is an increase in polarization. But I think if we were there are ways we can move forward. And I think there are positives that come out of it, but we get so caught up in the negativity of it. We fail to see that there are some truly great things that come out of it, right? Back then, if this was pre-technology in this lockdown, we wouldn't be able to talk to each other at all, right? No school. Like it, it, no school at all, right? We'd be very limited. And I think some stuff we, we take for granted because it's been with us for so long, right? You have the ability to call your parents at a moment's notice, to call your family, see how they're doing. And it's a, it's the small things that we don't, that we lose sight of because they're just so normal to us now, right? Uh, we have all these, all these ways to prevent drunk driving now through, through phones, right? So many different ways you can order a ride. These are, these are things that we've just grown used to, but they help our lives. They, they make life safer for everybody too, right? And I think we lose sight of just the little, the little things that, or even the big things that these things really do well. So that's the point yeah. I was trying to make. Yeah, so then, like, it's not going to be destroyed. Like, it's not like one day it's like, okay, we're going to get rid of it. Poof, it's gone. But like, do you think that they should change it just to make it better? I think... They can make changes. I don't. I don't want to force people to make changes because that's how ch- poor changes are made, right? If we were to force any tech company to change, it would a. They would a probably have to change employees. Yeah, I'm not really employees. saying force. I'm just saying like, should they change? Should they change their mission rather than just trying to get as many people on their site? Should they change it to like, okay, we're gonna try to get people on our site, but we're going to also give good information, you know? We're going to give a platform where, you know, we can try to make as much good things happen rather than we're just going to give a platform and see what happens. Like, do you think they should change it like that? I think trying to force everything to be good is a terrible way to make everything good because you don't solve the issue, you cover it up, Mm -hmm. right? And I think if you want to make a change like that, it doesn't come from the company, rather it comes from us, mm-hmm. right? We, we could force every kid to do their homework. There still will be the ones that don't. There will still be the ones that copy homework, right? There will still be the ones that write bare minimum just to get it in. But then here's my question is, how do you, how do you change if what you're seeing is shaped by them on purpose too? Like they're shaping your view. How do you change them? And, you, and you're not aware of what they're doing. And that's why I'm saying that they should change because, well, yeah, we can all change. We can all improve, try to make it better. 
But at the end of the day, they're still the ones who are using us, right? We're the users. We're the product. So what do you think of that? I think the whole statement of us being the product is... It's a statement that has been made. <laughs> but it's true. That's that's what the product that we're the product. That's what we're the, the social media, that's what they made it for. Yeah. So. They made it they made it to get us. I don't see how that in of itself is the biggest issue as long as we truly benefit from it. Right? But we're not truly benefiting from it. That's the thing. They're shaping our realities individually, causing things that are bad. Sure, the small things can help. Like we can connect with friends, we can do our Google Docs and stuff. But when it really matters, it's causing a full nation to divide in political and just straight up country beliefs. And it's all because of the way that they're being shaped by using these things. So do you think that they should be changed as a so goal? I think to this is where we see, so sorry, sorry to cut you off. Uh, we see two big differences in how I think we just, us two see the world, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, Orwell and what was the other guy? Huxley. Huxley. So, I'm assuming you see more of Huxley in the world. Right now, yeah. Back then, it was definitely Orwell. But I think we've sort of moved away from that Orwell because now we're moving towards the left of the spectrum. So, yeah, for me, it's more Huxley. What about you? Me, I still see... <laughs> A lot of a lot of Orwell. I see some Orwell that we choose to ignore, right? Because we we get caught up in this so much. Like we the ability to struggle from this is a is a problem that not every country has. The ability to divide themselves like this is not a problem in country. And now, before you say what are you talking about, I like to bring up this point. If you were to have a different opinion in a place like Russia, North Korea, or China you will not live very long or you will not be at your home residence for very long. You might get moved to somewhere else, shall we say, right? His ability to discuss, his ability to discourse is a privilege that we have, that mm -hmm. we take for granted. And because of it, we can see all these problems that maybe that aren't the most, pre that are issues that we make pressing. I think that social media and it's, its whole purpose and design to capture us as users to keep going back, I think that could obviously be changed. I think their mission should be to get the most users, but not to trap the most users. It's the difference. If you go yeah, to a site, if I you go to a site willingly, that's that's you. If the site keeps getting you to come, is basically almost forcing you to go back, there's a difference. Now, there's two ways they can do about it. They can do it... Uh, Subliminally, subliminally, right? So through, through the little notifications they get, right? That's one way to do it. Or it's the only site you have. It's, it's in China, they only have one site, right? Or they have like three, a few sites all controlled by the same place, right? Uh, in Russia, there's not much or any really alternate news, right? You get the news that's been officially given. So I think this issue we have, yes, it is terrible, but it's a it's a it's it's more of a problem that we have here yeah. basically here right yeah. here in places like canada united states france britain right countries that we're so well off essentially we don't have to we we don't have to worry about the other issues right places while there are places in the world who are going through water crises we are fighting uh big tech companies for moving us around when we in reality we get the benefits and there are people out there who make products for these companies that still don't really get anything right and that's that's one of the points i think it's that we were lucky that we're here and we have these benefits and there are places in the world who don't have them right places women's rights in the middle east still aren't a thing right and i think we lose sight of that because we fight these big tech companies, like they're the one true big enemy. And I'm not saying they aren't doing terrible things sometimes, 
but there are issues we still have yet to confront that because they're so far from us, it almost seems like they're not there, right? That's the point I make. I think tech companies, they're big, but there are there are problems because we live that life of luxury, that life of privilege where we have the access to them, right? That's the point I see it from. I think we can all agree there are some negatives. Definitely don't give a phone to a four-year-old, right? <laughs> Angry Birds, though, that game was awesome, you know? You remember that Star Wars Angry Birds? Did you guys play it? Oh, yeah, Angry Birds, are you kidding me? Yeah. No, well, the Star Wars one, you know? You tap it, and the guy went, shoo, right? <laughs> the lightsaber. That was awesome. I still remember you could, I don't know how, but I got, like, one of the packs where you could stick them on your, your tablet camera, your whatever camera you had, and it would give you one of the character in game. And I had a General Grievous one. Oh, man, you know, <laughs> rocked out. Well, as you can see, we could a bit off topic, but... I can't say we all didn't enjoy it. We had some lovely discussions. And however, we must close the episode. This is our last episode for the semester. We're ending it at six. A nice, nice little number. Two, two, and two. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, Dave's experiencing some technical issues with his Wi-Fi, so he couldn't be here to help close it out. But I'm Tristan Villamar. I'm Nicholas Biancolin. I'm Caleb De Silva. I'm Absalom De Vera. I'm Ethan McMahon. And we're so happy you decided to listen to our podcast. Um, we'll be back with some more episodes next semester. But yeah, as of now, just signing off. <laughs>